weeks have been really pretty exciting, you know, from the time when these online searches picked up this very loud trigger. You know, we've been through a whole series of exercises to figure out what this was, and many of them, underlying them, are self-doubt. We're like, could we have caused this by our own ignorance or anything from accidents to, you know, to malpractice? When we got that second week signal, that's when I really finally accepted. Oh my goodness, there is actually a population of binary black holes out there and this is happening for real and we're making real discoveries. We're opening a brand new field of astronomy. We're discovering binary black holes and I'm part of this historic discovery. Every check we've done has kind of come back saying, no, this really came from some astrophysical origin, we believe. And so then you start almost believing it. And that's pretty cool. I just couldn't believe this was actually happening and, and I was experiencing it. It was a challenging task. Uh, first, I wanted Thai people to know about this big, big discovery. And I know that there's, there's no media that I know of is going to translate this for them. So I took over, I looked at it. It took me eight hours, but I did it. <laughs> I did a lot of Googling because many of the ideas and topics that I learned was in English and I have never had a Thai word for it before. It's how I imagine uh, getting out of the moon lander and setting foot on the moon for the first time. It was just fantastic. I cannot uh, yet believe it. For five months, we kept this secret. It was so nice to just uh, have it there and explore it and uh, look at it and analyze it. But I think it's the right time now to, you know, let it go and so that other people can know about this. Good morning. Without a doubt, the reason so many of us are here today is because we believe in the potential of the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Opening a new observational window would allow us to see our universe and some of the most violent phenomena within it in an entirely new way. It has been a long, hard struggle to get to this sensitivity. It's not been easy. We've pushed the boundaries of technology in several different areas, and with lasers, with optics, suspensions, and probably lots of other areas. We do a set of um, ambient noise coupling checks. It takes about a week to run all over the detector and uh, blast everything we can think of, magnetically, acoustically, vibrationally, because we optimize for what hurts us the most. The mirrors themselves in LIGO have to be delicately suspended, isolated from all sources of noise. My work on that was in the area of the silica suspensions to make these all ultra pure glass suspensions to hold the mirrors of the interferometers almost motionless, just waiting for a gravitational wave to pass by. As people know, the interferometer is getting better and better. We are hitting the limit of the very basic noise limit, which is called quantum limit. So for this quantum limit, that Heisenberg said that we have a limit that we cannot go through. And we are hitting that limit. So we begin to think about the question that, how can we go around that? How can we do better than this limit? I always think it's like, the interferometer is like a tiger that is running really fast. And we have put some wings for that so that the tiger can fly. I generally didn't know a lot about physics. I was mostly curious, um, but I didn't, I didn't get to really look into it in high school because I my, my counselor at the time didn't think it was uh, something I should pursue. And back then I was really, um, I guess, like I was easily influenced, so I decided not to. 
I want to go to grad school and um, I want to pursue a PhD in physics and I want to continue research in gravitational wave physics. <laughs> grad school I was probably one of the few women I was at UT Austin University of Texas Austin and I had been really good as an undergraduate and I go in there and all the guys in quantum mechanics were just like oh, this is so easy and I thought oh I didn't get an A in this test I'm failure and then I saw their tests and they were worse grades than mine and I was like wait a minute you're all talk what is this one thing I got a lot from um, astronomer friends was oh you're never going to see anything, and you know, it's a waste of time. But, I mean, it's really cool. Why, if, if there is a chance of detecting these things, then why on earth would you not work on it? I mean, I personally work on working out how giant stars explode when they die. And then looking, um, looking at that um, by the ripples in space-time that a neutron star creates when it's formed. Why would you not work on it? Over the course of decades, the properties of neutron star matter have been a mystery. Black holes are, of course, very intriguing objects, but they're also very simple because they consist only of warped space-time, so to say. I mean, it's hard to imagine, but okay. But for a neutron star, there's a lot more to know about it because of the matter that it's made of. And that matter is really also very hard to imagine for us because it's basically more than the mass of the sun compressed into a radius of 10 kilometers into a small sphere. And it's incredibly dense, and we don't really understand what this dense matter is made of. We study these amazing things, explosions in space, but I still love going to the mountain. That first night, when that first image came in, and you could see the new source, and it just was slightly offset from the galaxy, and it's like, my breath did stop for a minute, and it just reminds you how amazing the universe actually is, and how fortunate we are to be able to do this for a career. We've said that the universe was kind to us with the first black hole merger being so bright and then this neutron star merger days after Virgo turned on. It's the, the universe has been so kind to gravitational wave astronomy. Tell me something good.